in our series that we started about three years back in September with the objective of bringing contemporary issues to India. And we deliberately kept a blend of scholars from within the country and scholars from outside the country. We also made sure that during this journey that we have, we have the best minds across the world speak to us. We have been very fortunate that we have been able to maintain that high standards. We have had two Nobel laureates come and speak to us. And we have a few lined up now, the best minds as you will see in the next few months who are going to be speaking at our forum. The issues of course are always contemporary, but they range from pure economics to sociological, sometimes to defense, geopolitics, as well as sometimes to issues like poverty, unemployment. So the major spectrum that we have kept in mind is socioeconomic issues plus geopolitics. We have been very fortunate in this very context that like today, we have had the best minds on geopolitics speak to us even in the past. Today's issue has been a very perplexing one. We have had three webinars on the Russia-Ukraine war since it started in February 2022. When we first did our webinar, the understanding was it will not last very long. When we did the second one, the feeling was it cannot last very long. It has to close. And then when we did the third one, there was so much of uncertainty. Today is the fourth one in the series. As an economist, I've been very worried. What are the economic implications of the Russia-Ukraine war? As you know, as the war started, prices started rising up, but the American sanction on Russia only made the situation worse. Rather, Europe and America themselves suffered with the sanctions. Not much has changed since then. The monetary policy of advanced countries, as well as Europe, has altered for all times to come. Inflation still continues to be high, and despite a year and a half of measures announced, initiated, and implemented, inflation is not looking down. Inflation is much above the comfort level of the advanced countries of nearly 2%. Economic growth has also suffered severely. Otherwise, as an economist, it is difficult to believe that Russia, which hardly accounts for 1% of world GDP, and Ukraine, which accounts for hardly 0.3% of world GDP, could shake the world so severely. But that is exactly how it has happened. The growth rate of the economies across the world have suffered severely and in the current year, as well as the next year, the prospects are not very bright. Next Friday, we have a presentation on the global economic growth prospects from the World Bank, their director of research, IN Coase, speaking to us. The report has just been released two weeks back. The World Economic Outlook released about a month back at the IMF also painted a grim picture. Given the situation where growth is not recovering, inflation is high, and nearly a year and a half has passed for this war, it is obvious that we would like to understand what is happening in this war. To understand this, we couldn't have got a better panel that we have been fortunate to get today. We have Ambassador Verma, who has worked in Russia. We have Ambassador Puri, who has worked in Europe and United Nations. And then we have retired Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, who's very active in policymaking in India, in Delhi. 
So let me briefly introduce the three speakers and then we will go to them to understand what is happening in the war, what can we expect, how long can we expect, what are the viewpoints that seem to have got ignored, especially the viewpoint from Russia seem to have been totally ignored. And now, what are the corrective measures that the war comes to an end? It is probably nobody's interest that the war continues. I am an outsider to the war in terms of the military strategy as well as diplomatic core. But I myself feel as an economist that maybe Russia has played the cards very, very well. The world is suffering. So to answer and understand these issues, we will request the panelists to kindly guide us and share with us their thoughts. So let me first introduce Ambassador Verma. Ambassador Verma was a member of the Indian Foreign Service from 1988 to 2021. During his diplomatic career, he has worked in the Ministry of External Affairs, in the Office of External Affairs Minister and the Prime Minister's Office. He served as India's ambassador to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, to the Kingdom of Spain, and to the Russian Federation until October 2021. Ambassador Verma has vast experience in India's security and defense policies, including its nuclear missile and space programs. He has more than 12 years of experience in the field of multilateral non proliferation and disarmament, nuclear, chemical, biological, and conventional weapons, having served three postings in the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. He, has all, he also served as Joint Secretary in charge of disarmament and international security in the Ministry of External Affairs between 2010 and 2013. He was a member of the United Nations Group of Government Experts on Missiles, and disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation education. He was also a member of the Indian delegation to the UNGA in 1988-99, 2003-2005, and 2008-2016. He has attended nine sessions of the United Nations First Committee and seven sessions of the United Nations Disarmament Commission. With three separate postings in Moscow, spanning three decades, Ambassador Verma has vast experience in India's strategic relations with Russia. As ambassador, he was closely involved with developing India's relations with Russia, including PM Modi's Act Far East initiative, deepening of India's defense, nuclear space, energy, commercial science, and technology and cultural relations with Russia. He has spoken at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum and the Eastern Economic Forum our next speaker is Ambassador Manjeev Puri. Ambassador Manjeev Puri joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1982 and has served as Ambassador of India to the European Union, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Nepal. Earlier, he had served as Ambassador, Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations during the time that India was on the Security Council. He retired on December 31, 2019. Ambassador Puri has also headed the division in the Ministry of External Affairs dealing with United Nations issues on the social and economic side and been involved as a lead member of the Indian delegation at numerous global negotiations on climate change, sustainable development, migration, human rights, and United Nations reforms. In addition, he has served twice in Germany, in Bonn and Berlin, in Cape Town, Muscat, Bangkok. Major areas of his experience relate to multilateralism, Europe, and Nepal. His professional focus has been on issues relating to the environment, climate change, and sustainable development. He was a lead negotiator for India at the United Nations on issues relating to the post-2015 development agenda, sustainable development goals, and at the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in June 2012. He was a key member of India's delegation at various climate change negotiations, including the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC in Copenhagen in December 2009, 
and before that at Montreal, Bali, Bonn, and Poznan. Furthermore, he was involved with India's participation in the G8, G5 summits from 2005 onwards and was the point person for the major economic major economics forum. Our last speaker for the day is Lieutenant General Dr. Rakesh Sharma. Lieutenant General Sharma was commissioned in Gorkha Rifles in 1977 and had a career in the Army spanning 40 years. He has had extensive operational experience in Jammu and Kashmir, Northeast, and on the Western borders. He had trained the Botswana Army for three years in Africa and attended the National War College at Abuja, Nigeria. Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma attended the NDC at New Delhi. He was research fellow at IDSA and has done PhD in defense studies. General Sharma commanded the Fire and Fury Corp in Ladakh, facing both Pakistan and China. He was the Adjutant General responsible for the human resource management of the Indian Army. He is regular participant in seminars, lectures in various institutions, regularly writes for newspapers, military journals, and contributes chapters in edited books. He currently holds the General Bipin Rawat Chair of Excellence at USI New Delhi, is on the Executive Council of MPIDSA, and is Distinguished Fellow with Vivekanand International Foundation and Center for Land Warfare Studies, PLOS. With this brief introduction of the three speakers, I now invite Ambassador Verma to share his thoughts with a request that he should share and speak to us for about 20 minutes. And then we will go to Ambassador Puri for another 20 minutes and General Sharma for another 20 minutes. We'll be left with 15 minutes of question answers. Ambassador Verma, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Charan Singh. Thank you so much for this invitation and uh, very nice to be back with uh, uh, the EGRO Foundation. Uh, you know, we had the pleasure of interacting with you and on your programs uh, some months ago uh, in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and also very happy and uh, to be part of this program with my senior colleagues, Ambassador Puri, uh, General Sharma, who, uh, who we have all worked with uh, on many occasions. Uh, I'm feeling a little sort of embarrassed that I'm you asking me to go first in the presence of my senior colleagues, but I take it that because of the uh, there's a long, uh, strong Russia uh, angle in this Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, so I will I will focus on that a bit in my opening remarks. Uh, basically, I think the general trend now is well established. Uh, it is something that we had uh, indicated and predicted uh, at the beginning of the conflict that this is not merely a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. This is a conflict between uh, Russia and NATO and uh, Russia and the United States uh, and the West as a whole, uh, so to speak, Japan and Australia and things like that. And that has become more and more evident as time has passed. Last year, there was a lot of uh, admiration for the manner in which Ukraine was defending its territory and its independence. But now the perception is slowly changing. It is uh, uh, Ukraine, the perception is one of uh, being more and more desperate uh, for foreign assistance and foreign arms. The Ukrainian army, as we know it, at the beginning of the war has now been completely decimated. Ukraine has mobilized another army and is now fighting almost with uh, NATO supplied, almost entirely with NATO supplied uh, weaponry. On the Russian side, we see that uh, uh, the Russian military campaign last year was 
uh, full of uh, instances of incompetence and mistakes. But I think this year uh, the Russian military has learned. Uh, it is fighting a war of attrition. Uh, it is fighting it very patiently. Um, and the aim of the attrition is to hold on to territory that it already has, but also to inflict more and more damage and uh, destruction to the Ukrainian armed forces. And that process is continuing steadily, step by step. So overall, uh, while there is a prolonged war, the prolonged war is due to the fact that uh, neither side is fighting for limited objectives. In fact, this is a war of escalating objectives. Uh, the West, uh, NATO and the United States want to weaken Russia, not just defend the Ukraine, but weaken Russia. Russia wants to weaken as much as possible the Ukrainian state, and the first step to do that is through uh, degrading its military potential. And both sides are also waiting for a decisive turn on the battlefield, which is not coming. Though Russia is gaining us a, a slightly upper hand in the military campaign this year as compared to last year. There is no decisive victory that is coming to either side. So the war, there are reasons why it has become a prolonged war. Because the war aims are pretty ambitious. And uh, both sides are willing to take casualties of a very high order for the war to continue. And there are very little international constraints on uh, the war to stop. There is a demand for peace. Uh, our Prime Minister has spoken uh, of, on many occasions that we are in favor of peace, that he has said very clearly this is not an era of war. The general sentiment in the global, global South is in favor of peace, of restoration of uh, diplomacy and discussions. But the sides, the two, uh, the two sides to the conflict themselves are not convinced that this is a time for diplomacy. There was a small window for diplomatic solutions probably in March and April last year. But that window seems to have now closed, uh, you know, closed or it is, uh, you know, in a very uh, a tight uh, shut position. The impact on Russia, the expected economic collapse of Russia has not occurred. In fact, the Russian economy has been able to um, stabilize itself. But the Russian economy stabilization has come at a fairly high cost to both Russia uh, economically and politically. So how long that will continue, we'll wait and see. The sanctions have not changed Russian war aims, but sanctions have started weakening the Russian economy over the long term, over the medium and long term. Now that said, uh, the Russian defense industry has bounced back. Uh, you know, the Russians are now are fighting with uh, no shortage of weaponry on their side. And some of their weaponry is also now uh, pretty top class. So the problems that they faced last year, I think have been addressed in some way. So it, there is a paradox, so to speak, uh, on the fact that the Russian economy becomes more and we more weak as we as we go along, and the Russian defense industry and defense strength actually increases. The reasons for the Russian uh, weaker economic growth and prospects is the fact that it has been cut off uh, by sanctions from the Western world, so to speak. Uh, its oil revenues are declining. It is getting less and less money from the oil exports that it does because uh, it is uh, exporting them to countries like China or India or other countries at prices which are lower 
than than uh, uh, than the international uh, prices. So so these changes are happening. While I think in the international context there is no, I think there are a lot lot of disquiet on the fact that Russians are undertaking this military campaign. But in the global south as a whole, I think there is. Uh, little support for the Western definition of the war as one between democracy and autocracy. I don't think there are many takers of that, except for 30, 40 countries who are close allies of the United States. Russia has uh, the sanctions process on Russia has never been complete. Russia is too big a country, it's too vast. Um, and it's got deep linkages with the global economy in various ways. So it is quite impossible to impose the tight sanctions on Russia as was possible in smaller countries like Venezuela or Iran or or, or Syria or DPRT. Russian oil exports and economic engagement with the countries outside uh, the West, uh, including China, India, the Gulf, Southeast Asia, Africa, Iran, uh, Turkey have proven very, very important. Uh, this is a safety valve that has come in use for Russia. And it has become a huge advertisement for other countries in the world who see the risks of weaponization of global interdependence. So that is one of the reasons why groupings like SEO or BRICS have become so popular. Countries want to join these organizations because they want a protective cover, seeing the experience that Russia itself is, uh, is doing that. On the other hand, uh, well, let's spend a little time on what is happening with the with the with the US US. Very clearly now the United States is the main driver uh, for the Russia Ukraine conflict uh, on the Western side. So there will be no peace or there will be no diplomacy or the war will continue until un, until and unless the United States itself is convinced that there has to be a change in position. That has not come about uh, very easily because there is a very deep seated belief in the United States that Russia is a very weak country and uh, Russia should not only pay for uh, what it has done in Ukraine, uh, Russia should be weakened further so that it, these things are not repeated in the future. I mean, basically, uh, there is a Russian rebellion on against what is the European structure of unipolar security dominated by the United States. And the United States says that this rebellion will need to be crushed. That is the feeling until now. Whether things will change in the future, I don't know. Uh, given this feeling, there has been a steady escalation uh, of support for Ukraine from uh, artillery pieces to HIMARS to um, advanced uh, you know, tanks uh, to now F-16. Yesterday, the United States took a decision to supply cluster munitions, the cluster munitions which had, uh, you know, uh, which are generally not accepted as usable weapons of war <clears throat> under international law, including by India. We have not signed the cluster munitions convention but there's a general feeling that these are weapons that should not be used. And the US itself, since 2017, has, has a policy that it will not export cluster munitions. It will itself will phase out cluster munitions. And any cluster munitions which have more than 1% dud rate uh, are illegal by US national legislation. Now, the United States has, of course, overturned its own national legislation to supply these weapons to Russia. Now, this I'm giving it an example that the process of escalation ladder of weapon supplies from the West to Russia is continuing. 
and there are some extreme measures also that have, we have seen in uh, the destruction of the dam, uh, 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 the threatened uh, attacks on the nuclear power plant. So, the, unfortunately, the tendency is towards escalation and not de-escalation. So unfortunately, that is where it is. The United States has also come back in a very big way in Europe. So that's one of the big geopolitical <coughs> consequences of this war. And uh, it practically dictates European policy today. I mean, individual countries like France and Germany occasionally make noises about uh, strategic autonomy and independence. But in reality, that has now almost practically disappeared. Uh, we deal on the, especially on the issues of war and peace, we are dealing with a Europe that is now merely an extension of the United States. And there are good reasons why the United States is able to dominate Europe in such a, in such a massive way. Firstly, uh, Europeans themselves have proven unable, either through military deterrence or through sensible diplomacy, to deal with the so-called China th uh, Russia threat, and the Russia threat is now very much blooming large in European countries. And uh, there are a large number of European countries, especially those bordering in uh, Russia in the Eastern Europe, Baltics, Poland, and other countries, which believe that uh, the true protection against Russia is a greater role for the United States. Secondly, the United States is today the largest energy exporter in the world. It produces 13, almost 13 million barrels a day and it leaves behind Russia and Saudi Arabia and the OPEC. And it has become an energy power in its own right. And the United States is not hesitating to use energy its energy strength as an instrument of, uh, of weaponizing global interdependence. So it has very clearly and very firmly imposed these energy sanctions on Russia. So a huge market that has opened up. It is now a very big player in terms of energy uh, issues, and uh, it is also taking on the uh, it is also taking on the power of the OPEC and. OPEC now is backed up by uh, Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis feeling the pressure that they have feel from the United States, given the fact that the United States is now such a big energy exporter, have done their own readjustment of their uh, uh, policies in the region, primarily also settling uh, or bringing to some accommodation their relationship with Iran, because both Iran and Saudi Arabia require more space uh, to deal with what the United States is basically doing. The US is also putting a lot of pressure on uh, on the European countries, not only to cut off from Russia, but also to recalibrate their relations with China, both in the, as a market, both as a technology partner and things like that. Uh, there is a difference between how the West deals with Russia and China. With Russia, there is absolutely no go. There is no dialogue, uh, and there will be none until the war is settled one way or the other in Ukraine. After the initial uh, pushback against China, both the United States and uh, Europe are trying to find a modest vivendi with China. That is the great difference between Russia and China. Of course, we heard last year a whole barrage of uh, uh, articles and interviews which said that Russia was now a vassal, a uh, subsidiary uh, chela of China. These all came from the West. And of course, many of our analysts uh, sort of blindly sort of picked it up. But now the trend is uh, somewhat different. Um, the Western analysis now, I mean, you see it in uh, the main Western media and in the main Western journals, is that China does not see itself as a, in its interest to support Russia because it has more interests in dealing with the United States and Europe because of the huge trade relationship, which is absolutely right. So there is a gap between Russia and China. 
but the this myth that Russia and China are together is something that we also believed. Uh, we took it hook, line, and sinker. But uh, Russia's trade with China is about two hundred billion dollars. Yeah, about forty billion dollars is in Russia's favor. India's trade with China is about one hundred forty billion dollars, thirty-five one hundred forty billion dollars. Hundred dollars, hundred billion dollars in favor of uh, China. I mean, so the trade surplus in favor of China. The United States EU trade figures with China are 1.3, 1.4 trillion dollars. So the comparisons are very, very different. So in this geopolitical game, each country will have to fight for itself. We have to, I mean, which is natural, which is only to be expected. Uh, Europe faces a particular problem because European prosperity and security was based on the fact that they would get cheap Russian gas, uh, ample Chinese markets, and uh, inexpensive American security through NATO. All three are changing and the Europeans are struggling. We see some social and uh, domestic instability as we've seen in France, but that uh, the European shift to the right is probably just beginning. I will end by a few words on India-Russia relation. Uh, we, I think it's a measure of the success of our diplomacy that given the great turbulence in the international system, India has been able to maintain a certain balance in our relations with Russia. Obviously, we are not happy with the continuation of the war, but we also believe that the war was not unprovoked and there is certain history going back to, and in whatever way the war is settled, uh, the legitimate interests of um, Russia need to be uh, to, to be taken care of. From an Indian perspective, I must say, we don't say it too often outside. Ukraine looks more and more like Pakistan. That Pakistan's ambitions and to take on a much larger country like India actually began because it got this false impression that uh, it could do so because of its alliance relationship with the United States. I think there is a repeat of this in a broad sense. I mean, no historical uh, contingencies are the same, but uh, Ukraine too has chosen to pick its security in the context of what its relations with the United States were. And it is now on, on the way to reaping the, the, the results of that. Whether it's good or bad, it's for Ukraine to decide. But uh, similarly, what happened to Pakistan in 71, 65, 71. I think another version of that is now happening in Ukraine. India has benefited from Concessional oil prices that we are being given. In fact, the best concessions are being given to Indian companies, no, more than Chinese companies. Uh, Prime Minister spoke to President Putin uh, recently, especially after the visit to the United States. Our trade relations are more than 40, 45 billion dollars, which is a record. We have things to go, but there are systemic difficulties still in place. Uh, the banking channels are not uh, fully uh, able to fully facilitate what uh, what is possible in the relationship because of the fear of sanctions. Uh, there are transportation problems with respect to the North South Corridor. Um, our business community is still not uh, confident enough to uh, do business in Russia because of the fear of sanctions. They would rather do business in the West. Uh, but as things go along, uh, things will change. Uh, so I will stop here. It is an uncertain period. Uh, it is difficult to give uh, very clear predictions, but uh, I must say that total analysis we have done in the past meeting have not been uh, have not been uh, off the mark in, in any very major way. So I think uh, basically in our, in our analysis we are doing uh, as part of this e grow foundation seminars we are doing rather well. Thank you. Well, 
Ambassador. This was a fantastic, uh, I would say, a complete overview that we would expect, laying the proper context. I would now like to invite Ambassador Puri to please share his views. 20 minutes, sir. Uh, Professor Charan Singh, thank you very much. And let me echo what you just said. I am very glad that we had the privilege once again of having uh, Ambassador Venkatesh Varma here. If you recall, when you had this last time, this subject matter in November of 2022, just some months earlier, and literally a few weeks after this conflict broke out, Ambassador Verma was the one person who headlined this in the Indian newspapers that, guys, it's not going to happen very quickly. This was soon after, you know, the so-called grand 15 days takeover of Kiev matter came to an end and everyone said the Russians have lost it. And then Ambassador Verma wrote his large piece. And I want to just tell you that I'm very glad that he's there with us today because there's perhaps hardly anyone who can give you this kind of overview and at the same time a realistic idea. Now, you know, General Saab is coming on after that and his appreciation of military, including hardware, is not something that I can uh, talk on with great authority. But let's also understand a few things. One, if you look at Western media, you will think that the Russian army is decimated, finished, gone, they have no weapons. I don't know, but to me it would appear that even the use of these Wagner forces was actually a sign of the fact that they were just sitting back and letting these guys do the, let me say, the dirty work. We are speaking here in Chatham House rules among ourselves. Uh, air power has been used very sparingly. And, you know, the threat of tactical nuclear weapons and all is loomed down upon us all the time. I'm not saying that it won't happen. I have no ability to be able to say anything. In the last few weeks, the general conversation is Putin is weakened. I don't know the answers to that, but I will just say one thing to you. Even if I assume Putin is weakened, I'm not sure that can ultimately mean Russia is gone and finished. Remember, even at the time when the Soviet Union broke up and you had Yeltsin and others, the country has come back. It's because of the nature of the country, the nature of the people, the nature of resources that it have and its geography. Let's also remember another thing. Most of the analysts and those who matter um, in terms of foreign policy guidance in the United States in particular continue to remain to be people who are basically Russia hands. And they happen, and it's, it's no secret that the top advisors in the Democrat Party, I'm not talking about the Republican Party. The Republican Party, you know, has its anti-Russia and those stance, but is isolationist. The Democrat Party is not left-wing. The other side of it are people who have this hegemony America theory. And there are lots of people there. I don't think I should name them. But the best known names out there are people who have been at this business of leveraging Ukraine right from the time that the Soviet Union collapsed. You know, I don't think we, we remember this. But in 1945, when the United Nations was established, was created, uh, Ukraine and Belarus, uh, Belar, uh, Belarusia, as it used to then be called, were original members, signatories to the charter of the UN. And so this relationship with Russia is of a somewhat different kind of an order. And it's something that you need to remember. Uh, ambassador Verma spoke about Pakistan. I used to be ambassador in Nepal. And very haltingly, if somebody asked me, you know, which is the nearest simile? And I would say that, guys, just think about Russia, Ukraine. And if you look at the numbers, that's perhaps better. Pakistan is 200 million. Uh, one of the larger economies, it will be. Forget what we are talking about. The facts are that it will be a very large economy because numbers is making a lot of difference in what is happening. Well, let me mention two or three other things to you. The European. There is little doubt that in February 2022, the, Russia, the Europeans just fell behind. And the European political class 
including the tallest current leaders, Chancellor of the German Republic, uh, of the German Bundesrepublic, as well as the French president, have all fallen behind. We've got to fix the Russians. There's absolutely no doubt. But, you know, let's just think about the population. I am sure people are hurting. This gas price business has not been an easy thing. It's all right that, you know, refined petroleum product coming from Russia and crude from India got sold there, helped stabilize global petroleum prices. But the fact is that their economies are hurting. The huge amounts of inflationary pressures that they are facing, and we keep hearing of this in the context of the United Kingdom, is not just because of the COVID recoveries and the lockdowns, etc. It's also because of the huge amounts which are being committed to this. And while in the United States, there might be a huge amount of political benefit. In, in fact, perhaps for the first time after 9-11, you had both parties, or rather the vast majority of members of both parties voting in favor of, you know, help Ukraine do whatever you can. And the large military industrial complex benefiting, the oil industry benefiting by sales to Europe, etc. That's not the case for the Europeans. Are they likely to change? I don't know. I don't think so. They are kind of caught in a grip, but it's a grip which is being felt. I mean, there's no doubt about that at all. You know, let me say a few other things, and I'm happy to take more questions, so I'll even speak much less. I don't have an answer when this one will end, but I can just say this to you, that the ability that simply being there and continuing is something that the Russians continue to have today. And we are seeing huge amounts of escalations, the Ukrainians even getting mercenaries, etc., from outside, carrying on their own bit. But the fact is that in various ways, they remain, I won't say intact, but largely intact. And this attrition kind of thing continues. So people ask the simple question, when would it end? Well, the one country where perhaps it lies in their hands to some extent, is domestic politics of the United States. But coming up the elections next year, are they likely to take a swing and say, come on guys, you know, let's talk, let's get it done with, doesn't look like it. I see the United Nations Secretary General, who from New York always keeps looking at Washington DC, not only the current Secretary General, all of them, for signals, you know, moving away from the whole idea of Ukraine. Have you heard him ever utter anything to do with Ukraine other than appearing once or twice on television when the grain deal was signed and nothing else after that? Is kind of wiped it off the agenda. It's one thing for us to say it's a failure of the Security Council. Sure, the Security Council was not about dealing with great powers, having it out with each other. But the one in institution that you have, the one individual, he may not be able to do much, but is he even trying to do anything? And the answer is no. And much of it, I think, rests with domestic politics in that country. Today, this is perhaps a positive deal. So when Trump and DeSantis and others sometimes make some noises that why are they we there in Ukraine, uh, Putin not such a bad guy, they immediately get shouted down. So let us remember that you know politics and domestic politics drives a lot of foreign policy, and there's no doubt about that at all. And this whole business of foreign policy being ultimately domestic is not something that we should discount, especially in the context of great powers and great powers rivalries, etc. Let me say one or two other things about India. You know, this, uh, the, the, this thing about India, let me make one point to everyone here. You've seen our recent uh, buildup of relations with the United States. Perfect. Good. No, there's no issue about it at all. But can I leave a thought to members of EGRO here that isn't it very interesting that, let me say the fact that we talk about multi-alignment, balance, etc. in the area of defense has got, in a sense, played vis-a-vis -vis us. Whether we need it or not, I don't know. General Sharma would be able to comment on that. But certainly, look for balance. Therefore, the next generation of aircraft you should buy from us. The next generation of, of heavy weaponry you should buy from us. Why? 
the simple answer is their weaponry is no good. You can see it being defeated in Ukraine. That may or may not be the case. But the fact that it is much more expensive, I'm afraid that doesn't go. So, you know, there are a lot of issues in some senses when you play the balancing act nobody looks at balance across the spectrum of relationships but people look at balance in every silo and in the most interesting silo of defense sales you say yeah you're 70 percent on the other side how about coming to 50 percent it makes a world of a difference i think we all need to understand this particular thing but this is what uh, the game is about Professor Chandu Singh, you started this session by saying you are an outsider, but you are looking at global economics. I think let's understand something very clearly. The global economy is not being helped by what is happening in Ukraine and Russia. Far from it helping, even the United States is principally suffering as a result of QE, huge amounts of money unleashed, which has resulted in inflationary pressures there and a lot of other factors. But the Europeans are hugely looking at what is the price, the current price they are paying for Ukraine. And if it comes to reconstruction, who's going to bear the cost? It's going to be the Europeans. And Ukraine at 46 million is not a small country by European standards. So just think of what it means in terms of Europe, in terms of its economy, in terms of its future, et cetera, et cetera. And these sanctions, et cetera, have cross um, uh, sort of implications. If Indian business is not willing to do any business with Russia, you know, I think we just need to go back. Indian businesses were not willing to do business with Iran. It's not an easy task. The Russians today are sitting on huge amounts of Indian rupees, and now they say for the oil, please pay us in yuan. And what is the choice that we have? So these are complex matters. There is interdependence. And this globalization has caused this interdependence and, you know, you there are prices to be paid. We are a, a wonderful geography in the sense of a kind of sweet spot in the world today, a little far from the fighting, a place where there is growth taking place. So lots of interesting things happening, the Chinese going down and the COVID business of, you know, building shorter supply chains, more resilience and in a sense in the Western world, the populations being a little wary of China. I mean, I'm not saying that COVID was caused by China and so people looked at it, but this wariness of China gives you opportunities. Have we leveraged it very well? Not as yet, but will we? Perhaps we will, hopefully we will. But we have certain opportunities, but they all come at a cost. And for the globe, certainly. You know, I'm sitting in the campus of the Punjab Agriculture University. And I must say, perhaps this is just coincidental, but one of the greatest fallouts of this Russia-Ukraine conflict for the developing world, particularly in Africa and other parts of the world, has been the huge amounts of grain shortage and fertilizer shortages that everybody has faced. And so, you know, sitting at the Mecca, which gave green revolution, etc., to India, it's particularly ironic, even for me, to look at all of this, that Africa, huge amounts of grain imports and look at some of the, uh, the the remarks which have been made by various people of late while this grain deal was uh, was signed everybody talked in terms of grain going to africa which used to import large amounts of grain from ukraine and russia and today what is it that we hear actually the europeans are siphoning off a great deal themselves because they need it for themselves so it's a it's a it's a complex set of issues extremely complex but you know the fact that it is happening in Europe, albeit not in Western Europe, but in that part of Europe, which has historically been the great context point, the contestation point, in fact, has been this particular sort of slightly Eastern part of Europe. The First World War, the Second World War makes this extremely problematic for the global economy and the way things are going. And uh, will, will things come to an end? I don't know. My own personal view on the matter would be, uh, at the very least, we need to wait and see how the US election and the run up to that election is going to take place. Because this entire idea of this is not an era of war, all very good to say. But the one person who is perhaps most important, perhaps more important than President Putin is the President of the United States. Because if that is the case, and they say there's a willingness, 
then a way forward which would be hugely face saving and would provide the minimum guarantees modicum of both um, both uh, let me say uh, ethnic guarantees as well as guarantees of military security etc to the united states uh, to the russians could be brought about but therein lies the great thing is it really the case as of now at least i haven't seen anything at all professor i am happy to take uh, sort of contentious questions on on this as well as uh, india we managed up till now pretty well and i have no re no reason to believe that we won't manage very well but the entire set of aspects there are a lot of issues to it this is a a, a egro session on the russian ukraine conflict but these other shows which are not side shows which are really the big shows as far as india is concerned india us what does it mean in terms of india and the rest of the world i think these are particularly important it isn't such a simple matter one side up hmm, some side has to go down but one of the little things i would leave is that the importance of a relationship with russia this is not just defense and oil but it is a relationship in my understanding which is critical also to see that the world in a worst case scenario doesn't become a g2 multipolarity is important and you mentioned that you know no country is powerful if its gdp is not high but you know russia is the honorable exception to this rule it always has been an exception to the rule perhaps it has something to do with this vast geography i don't know the answer but this is very important as far as we are concerned because um, just think about what i'm saying trans pacific is not an area that we are very familiar with but trans pacific is an old relationship which exists is that a con totally contestation type relationship now maybe is it one where some degrees of collaboration could happen maybe but do we end up with a g2 where do you remain on that i just leave that one thought for us in my opinion multipolarity is particularly important we would be a critical player in multipolarity provided there is multipolarity thank you thank you ambassador puri uh, excellent additions and taken a step forward i'm going to pose a question to both of you and we will take it when the question answer session starts but you can dwell upon it thinking about what you and ambassador verma said uh, one thing that probably because both of you stressed on the issue of is the war in the minds of the american um, presidents and is it having some critical ramifications so would a change in the party in power probably change the um, environment secondly is the time for the world and i thank you for this term multipolarity is it time for the world to think of a new international economic order where russia china india come together and say okay enough of western world's dominance so i'll i'll come back to both of you after general has mentioned and uh, general has shared his thoughts general as you have seen the diplomats one from russian the other who has worked in un and europe has shared their views we are uh, as far as the diplomacy is concerned clear as to what they say but is it the weapon industry which is engaging the world in such devastation and as mentioned is it pakistan in formation or is it afghanistan in formation and is this what the world has learned in the last few years of the second world war so i would request you to share your thoughts and if you can cover this two questions would be happy otherwise totally your uh, thoughts sir for next 20 minutes thank you professor charan saying uh, thank you for inviting me for the talk today and uh, it was a learning experience to listen to ambassadors uh, venkatesh varma whom i have been interacting for quite some time and ambassador manjeet puri and uh, uh, i mean egro i follow egro's uh, uh, sessions regularly and i i commend you for excellent work being done and great material which is being brought about into open realm in your discussion that take place on fridays so thank you very much now what i'm going to do is that i i am going to talk about 
four, five parts of this war that have taken place since the time war started. And I'll dwell on about six, seven issues, which I think are very important for us uh, to, to gather from what has happened or what's happening across in, uh, in, the, in this war. Now, I think uh, the word war stands redefined in many ways by what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. Because this war has been fought into, into many planes. There has been a political diplomatic war, there has been economic war, sanctions, a new kind of uh, war that's happened, the sanctions, the way it has happened here, information war, there is cyber war, trade war, space war, information again, and then of course, cognitive war, environmental and ecological issues, you know. So, I mean, you say there is multi planes that the war has been, ha it's been happening and, you know, it's all these wars are having effect across into, um, uh, into the global uh, parameters. So, like all wars, this war is also a messy one. And uh, everybody is lying. There is truth is a first casualty. Nobody is telling us the truth, neither the West nor uh, uh, from the war zone itself, everything is being said is untrue. So you have to sift out of the material and glean out what best can be done, what is not fake or deep fake, and what is actually being happening across on the war front. So this is a serious business to remain objective uh, in, in this in, in these times here. Uh, so there are a large number of lessons that people have been drawing out. We have to learn also from the success and the failures of all these places, um, what's happening there. So let's be divided into this year and a half into five parts. Say the first one, it started 24th of February, as we know, and the first part came up up to, say, uh, the um, uh, the first week of April uh, last year. Uh, the, the first six, seven weeks, you know, first six, seven weeks, the Russians then addressed four larger fronts from Kiev across to Kharkiv to Donbass and down to Kherson, uh, 2,000 kilometers plus, very wide area they had contacted. And they had hoped that uh, things would have been better, but of course, as time passed, by the end of the first phase, they had to withdraw out from Kyiv and continued across to Kharkiv and Donbass and Kherson. The second part of the war that started in the month of April and uh, continued till sometime in June, uh, or sorry, sometime till August, uh, actually established what the Russians wanted to do, that which has been stated earlier, it was the land bridge that Russians wanted to establish from Donbass across to Crimea. And uh, they captured Mari Mariupol, they captured, uh, strengthened themselves in Donbass, and um, they strengthened themselves into the Kherson area. So the whole uh, area was occupied by them, and uh, the, there was one contiguous uh, area between Donbass across to Crimea. But then in August to November, there was a turn, because by that time, the Americans had, uh, Americans and the West have dug out whatever reserves they had lying in where warehouses and whatever quality and pushed it across to the uh, war front, especially the um, uh, the gunnery systems, etc. But I, I would also say that the Rus the uh, the uh, Ukrainians have also been prepared for this kind of war from 2014 onwards when uh, the Crimea was lost. So for last seven, eight years also, the uh, Ukrainians were being prepared to ex uh, to, to to see what the Russians are going to do. So there was a preparation here. So when the third phase started, it, that's the time the Russians, uh, the artillery of uh, the Americans had fetched in large numbers, especially the high numbers, and it made a lot of difference across to Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians were able to um, uh, retake Kharkiv, which was a major loss to uh, 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 to the Russians because Kharkiv was a actually ethnically uh, a region which was more and more akin to uh, more Russian settlers there. So that was a great loss. The Russians lost nearly 8,000 square kilometers of area, which they had captured in, in the general area of Kharkiv. So thereafter, when it happened, you know, in this, in this phase, the uh, Ukrainians did one major thing. Of course, Moscow was down uh, the ship, but what actually happened is that even when the Moscow uh, was down, the things had not gone out of control. But when the uh, Ukrainians hit the curse bridge, that's the time things changed over. The, the uh, Russians by the time had not done uh, ad lib targeting of cities and of, of the infrastructure sector. The, on 7th of October, when it happened, thereafter the Russians opened up. They opened up the day, denied 50% of the energy sector 
of Ukrainians were decimated after the Kursk Bridge was down because the Kursk Bridge was something where President Putin had put his heart and soul into it as it came up in 2017, 18, and 19, the bridges as they came up. So, you know, uh, this caused great amount of upheaval across here. Then you come, and that time, of course, uh, 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 it, it came up across to this period of the fourth phase, which is, uh, which I would say is that attrition war that started about mid-November or something. The, Buck, the ba Battle of Bakhmut, eight, nine months it took to capture one small township called Bakhmut. And uh, of course, Solidar also, was, which was captured at that time. So, you know, this attrition battle and the trenches that were dug across and the minefields that were put across there took us back to 100 years of the First World War. That was a kind of warfare being prepared for. And uh, the the Russians having that time left Kherson, and rightly so. Kherson was across the river, across the pondage, and to sustain forces there was getting increasingly difficult. So I think a wisdom was... Uh, applied by the Russians and they would do back to own side of uh, the Dnipro River and they were able to strengthen themselves into defensive lines into this area and thereby the b battlefront reduced down to about 1100 odd kilometers from Donbass right right up to uh, the area north of uh, of Kherson uh, sorry north of Crimea so the, you know and they had multi-tier defenses being made into these areas so this attrition battle where nothing much was changing happened between November till till June, where the Americans and the West have been prodding Ukrainians to undertake a counter-offensive. Now, we know counter-offensives, you know, counter-offensive is one of the most difficult tasks to be ta undertaken when the other side is well prepared for it and anticipating that the, any counter-offensive will come between Z uh, Zephoria and, and uh, you know, north of Kherson and uh, uh, addressed towards Mariupol or uh, south of Donbass. So it was a small window where the, uh, uh, it could have been applied. So we have seen what uh, counter-offensive has been carried out. Counter-offensive is nothing to write home about. It is actually small, small pieces of four or five places counter-attacks being carried out. So I would say that there is, it's a more like a stalemate that's happening now. And the, uh, uh, the counter-offensive is nothing much to be uh, written home about. Having said that, let me come down to uh, six, seven issues, and I'll relate ourselves to uh, a situation that we are facing in India, especially on the Chinese border and uh, Chinese expansionism, which is also evident and what happens here. So the first question is, was this war inevitable? And then issues have been brought about over a period of time, you know, inevitability of the war, the economic costs, the humanitarian costs, overwhelming and devastating have been these costs. So, uh, the, the, there was a lack of political sagacity and diplomatic acumen on part of the West to avoid uh, this war, which could have been well avoided. Uh, but uh, once the war commences, it runs its own course. Then there are no assurances thereafter. So uh, the rationality and preventive diplomacy to avoid dispute and escalation uh, was not actually applied. In fact, sometimes it gives a feel that the the West, especially the Americans coming running up to the election time, were looking for an avenue to us recommence the war. You know, it suits uh, the election time in the United States to have wars. It suits in uh, the weapons industry, the military industrial complex to fight wars. And so this was a godsend opportunity for them to be applied. So they brought this to to this uh, context. So in the context of uh, India and China, is such a war inevitable, or it will happen? Now, I'd say that uh, the in economic interdependence even between Ukraine and uh, Russia was fairly large. And there was diaspora, I mean, pe people on either side of the border staying uh, of the same eth ethnicity. And despite that, the wars took place. So, you know, in, it takes place. The inevitability of war can take place must be taken into uh, cognizance. It, it can happen any time. Um, so there is a feasibility in Indian context, as, as we say. So what India was witnessed with China in 2020 uh, shows how fragile the peace is. The Ukrainians and the Russians had gone through the Minsk Accords. We too went through five, six accords with, with China. So the accords mean a lot, but then they are not, uh, you can't be dependent on the accords to deny yourself uh, um, inadequate preparations for the inevitability of war. So while these accords, five, six of them may stand on their own firm and we have relationship being established, but that is not a guarantee because the peace 
will remain. Uh, that's a, one of the brutal lessons that comes out of Ukraine war. Peace cannot be taken as a set of assumptions of stability and predictability of human behavior. There is adversarial leadership and wars can take place. Having said that, I'll come to the second issue. There is, this war has shown that there is a strong interaction between conventional and irregular. While uh, irregular and uh, asymmetric warfare. There is, uh, there is no match for conventional superiority in this manner. So US and NATO learned at their peril in Afghanistan that it's that their numerical superiority and US would have learned the same thing in, the, in Vietnam. The numerical superiority or a symmetric uh, superiority does not help in, in, uh, in winning wars. And the United States has to actually run with a tail between the legs. So that becomes a major, major issue. And these wars, even Armenia, Azerbaijan, there was Syrian uh, National Army here. There is there was um, Wagner Group or Blackwater or the uh, international, um, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainians created an organization called International Legion for um, uh, Foreign Fighters. You know, so there are a whole lot of private military companies also fighting in this war. It's not Wagner alone. Wagner has come to light. But then there are many other Chechens are fighting also. So there is a, uh, you know, who is fighting whom is, is a very uh, key issue here. So the irregularity as part and parcel of conventional warfare is very important to be understood. And, you know, it, it, it leads to uh, the issue that the conventional wars are becoming more and more conventional less, if I, if I may say so. So was there a, you know, a lot of people write about a flawed uh, Russian strategy, uh, a political military strategy. Now, this is important for us also because you know we also talk about the similar lines about uh, uh, the the absent dialogue between the military and the uh, and the political hierarchy. Is it relevant for us to now examine the Russian context? To was there a, a flawed strategy? So, when we study as a military uh, thinkers, we think that the quantum of force applied by the Russians previously over a 2000 kilometer frontage and uh, brought into bear without consideration of the air defense and other things which the Americans had already supplied to Ukrainians. So, that we thought it was little too less a quantum of force uh, applied over a 2000 kilometer frontage from Belarus to Kherson for carrying out the tasks that the military had envisaged. So there may be a disconnect between, because Jan Jarismov is a known personality. He has been writing, we have been following his writings for quite some time. So there was a little feel right from beginning that they are under strength. The Russians are under strength on the ground. If Ukrainians had collapsed on their own, a separate issue. But on the ground operations, there was a little laxity. And that's why when subsequently the Kiev operation was left alone, the Russians were able to get onto their feet and, and actually carry out this entire operation in a more professional manner than what they were doing at that time. So the, uh, the issues which I think the assumptions that they're taken, and we all actually, when we start talking about wars, we take on some basic assumption. So basic assumption that Ukrainian government was weak, and corrupt and you know it will cap capitulate under pressure or Europe had no ap appetite for war and Europe will not support a war or they are dependent on oil and gas or Ukrainian military was weak and it will melt away in, as they did in 2014 or that the eth ethnic population of the Russians based in Sumy and Kharkiv will rise in support of Russian troops. You know, all these assumptions did not come out to be exactly true. So, you know, this becomes an important part and parcel of our examination of what happened here. So, uh, I would say here that that initial bitter pill that the Russian establishment had to uh, accept it led to extensive adaptation of the entire war scenarios by the Russians in modifying their th thrust across to what they could manage to this 1200 kilometers frontage that they have today. And that is where if they come right from the beginning, the success would have been many fold larger. So uh, does this have a lesson for India? Well, much authorship will exist on Indian establishment towards an absent dialogue. And there's a book written by K. Subramaniam called Absent Dialogue and many other people keep writing. But I think there's a lesson for us. We need to discuss between the military yeah. and, the, and the political establishment all the time in peace time as to what are the likely scenarios that are going to happen and how best should we address these. So there is 
military history abounds by examples at the at the last moment in Kargil war they say you can't cross the line of control or 62 war you can't use the Indian Air Force or uh, the op pavan they said the orders were delightfully vague so you know we have been fighting with constraints the intermeshing of uh, um, plans between political establishment and military establishment are absolutely essential. The next part I wish to talk about is the uh, concept of, uh, which I mentioned also partly about the inadequacy of force being applied. Now, we have seen urban warfare being fought in the course of last 20 years, in uh, last 30 years. Grozny, it has been fought twice. There were Fallujah many times. There was Mosul and many times. Um, and, you know, all this while we find that the urban warfare and Ukraine was an urban state and the, the, the whole concept was fighting urban. If you see the size of Kiev was the size of, say, Bangalore and then all these satellite towns are, are around it. So there is an issue of uh, uh, urban warfare and, you know, the quantum of uh, force that has been brought about in. So there is immense urbanization, say, on the Indian Western Front. So, you know, uh, we have to consider that finally what has happened is that the urban cities, many of them has been uh, destroyed willy nilly. So the urban urbanization of areas, especially on the western borders, will have significant emphasis. If we learn from what has happened into this, this area, this will have significant emphasis on how the wars are going to be fought on, especially in the Punjab regions on both sides of the border. The issue in race is about the equipment. Now, many people say, you know, Russian equipment has failed and Russian equipment, you know, tank has come into much question, T-72 and T-90 tanks, uh, they cook off, the ammunition cooks off, etc. So they, these issues are important and they have been, uh, and you know, the American tanks and the Leopard tanks. Now, recently you see a visual, I see a visual in which uh, a tank column of Leopard 2s brought from Germany was uh, a tank column of one squadron was destroyed in one fire artillery fire carried out, pinpointed by the Russians here. So, you know, to say which tank is good, or which tank is bad, or tank's time is passed, or tank's life has gone away, you know, I think those are generic views, and they are not actually related to what's happening on the ground. So, whether it is M1 Ibrahims, or Leopard 2, or Challengers, each one has got its own problem. The Russians have yet not fielded their best tank, T-14. It is, it is still kept up their sleeve. But, it's a warfare where things have to be adapted. Things will change. Some somebody will fire. Uh, some some equipment will come under question. So you adapt to it. I think the adaptation being carried out by the uh, Russians continually, and also by the Ukrainians continually, is 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 so much to learn from. So there is a dynamism in the warfare. The people are just learning. Uh, there are apps being created every day on both sides of the border. An app which tells them everybody which uh, aircraft is flying, which guns are deployed, where, which is the target. There is so much to learn on what's happening on adaptability uh, in here. So I think we'll have to the tank will have to take a different avatar, maybe a, a direct energy weapon, a different metallurgy or protection, or improving its sur survivability. There is, of course, somebody right. Uh, it was rightly mentioned about conservative use of air force. Now, we have got fixated to the American use of Air Force. Air Force is where you go and destroy the enemy's air defense initially and you annihilate their bridges and infrastructure and then only the ground forces move in. You know, every time the wars are not fought like this. So the, air, the tactical Air Force use, useful, uh, uh, usefulness on low-flying operations came under challenge. <clears throat> but it has to be learned. You know, now you see the, the Russians have achieved some kind of superiority. And the uh, and the uh, Ukrainians are not able to contest that at all because the air defense has been quite suppressed. But initially, this issue was there, and it, it needed to be studied there. Can we predict the outcome of a war of this war? So outcomes of all wars are unpredictable. It cannot be forecast. There can be any amount of net assessments, algorithms made, war games, war simulations, limited exercises. Um, uh, you know scenarios of political diplomacy political diplomatic ways, but you know, the tangibles and intangibles in force or walk do not lend themselves to uh, quantification easily and answers easily. Do you get meeting, Harry? 
there is an immense role of morale, national military leadership, will, intuition, initiative, imagination, discipline to fight wars, deception. All this makes sure that there is no going to be easy victories. That's the future of war. Victory is to be redefined. <clears throat> you can't say creation of Bangladesh can happen again. That is not a victory. Capture of territory alone may not be victory. So the General, we can't hear you. General, we can't hear you. General, General, we can't hear you. Or in case in future in Chinese, uh, we have to we have to fight a war uh, with the Chinese in case we have to do so. It has to be done in a manner to, to work on Chinese weaknesses and not on Chinese strengths. And that is where we have to learn the art of how things have been continuing in this kind of uh, warfare that goes across in Europe. So, uh, I, sixth are the modern trends. Now, I think many things one can learn. 10,000 drones get uh, destroyed nowadays every week of the Ukrainians. And uh, one doesn't count about the Russians carried out. You can imagine the, uh, the kind of electronic warfare being carried out in this area. So these modern trains were not there. They were ballistic missiles, there were rockets being fired from fixed wing, helicopters, drones, sea, land, underwater, you name it. So... The firepower coordination with electronic warfare has changed the character of warfare in, in Ukraine. <clears throat> there is, there may be a need of in India to establish a, a geospatial intelligence agency or some kind of a unified uh, intelligence system in uh, in uh, what, what we see in Ukraine now, especially based on uh, on apps. So we we find that. Cyber, like you know, one of the British journalists said, cyber does not cross the Dnipro River. Understandably, but cyber electronic warfare will not replace conventional warfare. But their destructive potential must be must not be understated. So there is old style attrition warfare, old style industrial style of uh, contest of manpower, steel, explosives, and then there is a new style space. Elon Musk, Microsoft, Google. And then, of course, ammunition consumption. You know, the, the barrels have melted away amount of artillery being fired across into these frontier. So, you know, we have to think that there are old wars and there are new wars. This is enmeshed together. You can't say we are fighting the First World War, but we are also not fighting. Uh, um, uh, this is a 21st century. So the mass that we see, we used to say the time of mass has passed. Mass forces, mass uh, um, the bleach creek as fast, but then we see mass here. Then, of course, technology will overtake. And now we see technology also not overtaken mass stand. So the balance between mass and technology has become important here. So the life expectancy of a drone nowadays, they say, he flies three times only. Fourth time the drone is down. This is the kind of attrition being carried out. Uh, so the the, uh, the 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 systemic has changed, and you require mass production of it. These 31 drones that we get from Americans are great force multiplier. But you re we require mass drones like what the Russians are now getting from Iranians. So that's the thing. And my last point here, and I'll end after that, is the issue of this constantly debated information warfare and information dominance. I think uh, uh, we have lessons to learn here on in information dominance and information warfare. Uh, virality of information triumphs veracity. Truth is not important. It is virality which is important. And negative information is viral in no time. And then you keep correcting it. It's not so simple. So creation of narratives is a process that requires specialists. It requires people mandate specialization, specialists, social sociologists. It requires anthropologists. It, it is not a military job to create narratives. It requires people who have mind to create narratives. 
narratives of this kind. This is, I think, you know, we learn from Manipur what's happening in Manipur. We see women surrounding uh, army people and this happening. These, they require narratives or something happening in GNK requires narrative. This requires professional handling. People who are experts in media, people who are sociologists who think in that manner. So, you know, our handling of information in India, there is something to be learned across from what's happening on the uh, Russian side. Russians were weaker initially on information warfare and the West overtook everything. So I think we need to learn uh, a lot about information warfare. And I end by saying the question that you've been asking uh, Professor Charan Singh and um, the esteemed ambassadors. We cannot put our uh, all things into our, look at the equipment that the Americans have supplied into this area. All old equipment which was mothballed and kept into United States have been supplied across here. That's because the, it, that equipment also needed to be turned over. So I think, you know, that's why they said they will not give you 300 kilometers range rockets for high mass. You can only take 90 kilometers. So, you know, to rely on one source will be a negativism. We have to bank on the Russians who have been, who stood us through, uh, through, the, uh, through the time of last seven, seven decades. And, you know, we just cannot say the Americans will supply. This is a separate issue, but it needs intensive debate as to how we are going to manage our things in, uh, in future. Sir, I'll end here and I'll take on questions as come up, sir. Thank you, sir. Unbelievable discussion today. It means I want to just thank you. I've been part of many discussions, but I want to just mention both the ambassadors and the general, uh, the amount of information that you have brought on the table and the dimensions that you have covered are unbelievable. And I think everyone here uh, would feel obliged that so much has been learned. So what I'll do now, there are a couple of questions in the chat box, but what I will do, uh, just because of time, I'm going to request both the ambassadors if they have a view on the questions that I posed. And then um, uh, I think we will end because we have six minutes with us. And if we have a minute or two left after both the ambassadors have answered, we will take questions from the audience. My colleague, Dr. Vishandas is here. He may like to ask a question, but uh, I'll give him an opportunity after both the ambassadors have asked their questions, have answered their questions. Ambassador Verma. <clears throat> Thank you. And, you know, great delight to hear uh, both Ambassador Puri and General Sharma on this. You see, the last 30 years, <clears throat> We've had a certain set of fundamental assumptions, uh, uh, fundamental assumptions on how the world works. I think our uh, diplomats and our military people are learning the lessons on the changes that are taking place. I think it is also important for our economists to understand the changes that are taking place because uh, the geopolitical context in which globalization functions is uh, the bottom is falling off. So the meaning of markets, the meaning of uh, supply chains, the meaning of margins, the meaning of credit, the meaning of energy security, the meaning of, of multilateral trading arrangements, all this is changing. And the one change that is that has to be calculated very carefully by the economists is the following. You see, the main consideration of globalization was that the spread of division of labor across the world in which the market would determine the most efficient use of capital, technology, people, and, you know, uh, to, there, there was a certain sense of uh, reality to that, and the, the Indian economy benefited from greater globalization. But now the developed countries, the advanced countries are saying that it is not profit 
but it is security as defined by them. And they are willing to pay an additional price for uh, for that uh, outcome. So this meaning of resilient supply chains is nothing but free supply chains with an added political cost. So margins are changing. Now whether it has the same meaning for us as a country that is not engaging with any big major free trade arrangement or multilateral arrangement and we're still growing. And the things that are being done in the West. The diplomats and the military people are drawing their own lessons. I think the economic experts community in India, I think has to still to come up with a, a logical, logically argued conclusion on how they see this world changing. Presently, I must confess, uh, I don't mean this as a criticism, our economists in India are merely borrowing concepts which come in from the West. When they said friendly shoring, we also said friendly shoring. Then they said decoupling, we also said decoupling. Then they said, no, it's not decoupling, it is de-risking. We said, okay, de-risking. Then we say, they, they said it is, uh, uh, you know, resilient supply chains, we say resilient supply chains. So there is a great responsibility on part of our economists to come up with valid answers that are suitable for the country in the coming years. So I will stop there. Ambassador Puri. Uh, thank you, Professor Chandri. Rankard, you are absolutely wonderful, but guilty of this are not just the economists, but is your and my ilk more than anyone else. <laughs> you know, all EDMs are developed by them. So we simply iterate them or reiterate them. And that's not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for a long time. Professor Chan Singh, there's one word which has not been used throughout this seminar, but I think very, very critical. And the word is hegemony. This is about hegemony. Let's be very clear. If today the Americans say that the Washington consensus is no good, it's because for their hegemony, it is no good. And what they are now uh, alluding to and what should be done, resilience and all that business, it's because in, for their hegemony, that would be better. United States is a successor <laughs> hegemonistic power to what was earlier the Brits, the Anglo-Saxon power. Let's be very clear on that. I want to answer very briefly from my perspective. You need to have a whole session on this. You spoke about the multilateral economic architecture. So I'm not talking about Security Council, the world, how buying and selling happens. You know, after the 2008 uh, recession, in some senses, already a degree of G2 started happening, but the Europeans are hanging in there. And I'm afraid this particular thing, as we look at the voting power changes in the World Bank coming in next year, you could kick it down the road, I don't know, but on the other hand, I am not sure. What I am very interested in, and that's a subject matter of very deep interest to me, if you understand the game of hegemony and the way the game plays, you need to be very, very conscious of the importance of multipolarity, and I'm afraid not being uh, seen as a hanger on to the coattails of someone. I'm afraid that's very critical. Let me make two small points. India is the largest society in the world. You know, right now in India, everybody is holding their head up. What will we do with these people? Someone told me, agar 200, 300 million come hote. I mean, I had no answer for this kind of a, a, a thing for the person to say. What does it do? I know it's the largest market, huge skills. No, what it fundamentally does is perception. Every time a list is drawn up, you will be at the top of the list. Every time there'll be a change, it'll be difficult to bypass you and to go to anyone else. In 1945, it was not a problem. Secondly, we are on our way to becoming the third largest economy in the world. These are important elements. Therefore, this restructuring, will we have a place under the sun? That's of major interest to me because I'm afraid hegemony hasn't gone out. You need to play the hegemony game too. 
You can keep saying you're a force for good. Of course, we are a force for good. But the Americans and the British, etc., have said they've been civilizational forces for good forever. And they're not saying that they are not it. So this is a fact. And let me leave it at this. But I hope one day you will get us all together to talk about actually what is global governance and how nation states react, which is very, not very different to the way human beings react, but not very similar to the way nation states talk and articulate them. Thank you. The power game. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Ashok Vishindas, my colleague on the board, we both have founded directors of Figro. Dr. Vishindas, would you have a question? Yes. Th thank you, Professor Charan Singh. Thank you, Ambassador Puri and Ambassador Varmanji and uh, our Dr. Sharma. Uh, it's an excellent and very rich discussion I was hearing uh, throughout. Uh, see, uh, two small two three things one uh, suppose wa this war uh, ukraine and russia is going on for over 500 days and assuming that the clock is put back and will the putin do the same thing as he had done for 500 days that that is one and can any is there any estimate of what has been the cost on to the global economy because of Ukraine Russia war. And my third question is how and how much India and in what way has gained or its position has been elevated as a as a global leader, emerging global leader because of Ukraine and Russia war. Would any of the three uh, general would you like to take these three questions? You are not audible. General Sharma. Yeah, general, yeah. No, General, you are not audible. Can you hear me now, sir? Yeah. 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 Now, the uh, point I wish to make is that in case uh, the basic question you asked, would it be important for Putin to rethink how the wars are to be fought? I think so. If he, in hindsight, and you know we all do war gaming again as to how the wars should have been fought uh, he could reconsider you know he had to have twice uh, mobilization of his people the whole armies have changed the uh, people who fought the war initially are no more in the in the war zone the new armies have come in i don't think that kind of depth was given as to the kind of support that the west would provide to ukraine and the kind of wars that would be fought across uh, so in case he had to do so, General, we have lost you again. General, we have lost you again. We can't hear you. General, we have lost you again. We can't hear you. Achha. So I said, sir, that if he has to fight this whole thing again, it has to be fought in a different manner. The, uh, the Russian Federation, the strength that it had, had the capacity to achieve much more in a more focused manner in case it had gone right from day one into that throw. So I, I think there would have been a better thought. See, uh, in this game, he changed commanders at least six times, the overall commanders, because every time he was dissatisfied, he would change a boss across here. Finally, he brought the chief of general staff, like a CDS, to take over charge of the Ukraine war. You know, it's a these are not things done here. I think it could have been uh, uh, in retrospective, planned in a more focused manner. But then that's my opinion of, of this one. Yes, sir. Ambassador, sir. Uh, Ambassador Puri. Uh, Ashok ji, thank you very much. You know, this is a subject of a full EGRO webinar by itself. I, you know, and I'm very diffident at the fag end of this to make comments which are, you know, fairly political in terms of their understanding of things and would need to be defended. But let me say this, you know, far from what you possibly hoped would be said, and I would be very happy to say all that, you know, this has been a difficult task of juggling things and keeping them going. It's not easy. Uh, we have become a global sweet spot 
in various ways but had the global economy been doing much better and other things had been going very well and covid have been there and the uh, the the sort of china uh, impact of covid in the western world there things would have been far rosier as far as we are concerned not that much of juggling i won't say more than this but i hope in some senses i've left with you a, a kind of perception and thought which is with me it's a long subject and i'd happily discuss this with you whenever <laughs> bilaterally or otherwise i did allude to you know uh, changes in various things and generals have said we can't go away from those who have been solid and dependable till now so that was very very good and wonderful thank you thank, thank you thank you very much and this uh, is mr verma would you like to have the last word no i agree with uh... I agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Puri. It is a big subject, and we need more discussion. I, I mean, the only thing that I will say is that past understandings and past assurances don't work. So we should be open and uh, have a critical mind on what is happening. And secondly, we have to design solutions for ourselves. You know, this is a world that, uh, you know, the big look after themselves. The weak are left to suffer. Uh, we are neither. We are a growing economy. This coming decade will be the most important decade of our republic. Because uh, we are poised for growth and we should make everything possible to. But growth can go wrong if we make the wrong choices. So we should be very careful in what choices we make. Uh, China was fortunate because it grew for 30 years in a very stable geopolitical environment. That geopolitical storm in which we are heading into adds costs to us. So everything that we do economically, not just a market driven thing, but a geopolitical a driven cost in terms of uh, expenses and insecurity and things like that. So all things said and done, I think it requires as an effort for, for everyone and this has been a, a very good discussion and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity and uh, and bringing us all together thank you i must thank all of you both uh, the ambassadors and general sharma uh, for being with us sharing your thoughts so candidly i think it's been a great learning experience for each one of us each one of us the recording of this uh, will be available on our website tomorrow by noon and I'm sure each one of us is going to use this recording uh, to share with others because of the richness of the contents and the discussion that we have had. It's mind boggling discussion. The world is so much ahead. So much has happened. So much of adaptive adaptability, so much of dynamism, both in diplomacy as well as in the warfare. Unbelievable uh, developments in the last 18 months that the world has witnessed. So I'm thankful to you, all of you, for sharing your thoughts with us. Next week on Friday, 6 p.m. to 7, we have a discussion on global economic prospects. The presentation is being made by Dr. Ayan Kous from the World Bank. The report has just been released and the report is being presented here. So I would welcome all of you, spare your time, and I am sure you will find that report very informative, analytical, and rich, worth the time. That's the point I'm making. So with this, let me thank all of you, the speakers, the participants, my colleague, Dr. Vishandas, I um, want to thank all of you for being here, uh, added to the richness of the discussion, and I'm sure we have all benefited today from the discussion we have had. Thanks again, and see you next week. Thank you, sir.